First of all, I just want to welcome everyone into this space, as you are from wherever you are. Uh, we are holding this space for the development of community through contemplative listening and the exploration of music. So thank you so much for everybody who is joining us today from, from near and far as you are. So we'll start today by a little bit of a meditation, making yourself comfortable, finding yourself properly seated, with your sit bones firmly on your chair, your feet either on the ground or cross-legged. Finding that space to open up through the chest, breathe in nice, long, deep breath, filling the lungs from the bottom of your belly. And exhale slowly. And just allowing the breath to come in and out of the body naturally. Closing your eyes if you feel comfortable. Finding a focal point, either between the eyebrows or at your heart center. And just resting there for a moment in this space. Feeling the energy of all those who surround you. Thank you, everybody. I hope you feel centered and grounded as you enter into this space with us. I'm going to open up with a little reading from this beautiful book that I've been through a couple of times now. It's called Braiding Sweet Grass, and it's by this uh, lovely author, Robin Wall Kimmer, and she um, she writes about spaces on the West Coast here where we are um, in California, and she writes about, uh, you know, the kind of Great Lakes Basin in uh, upstate New York area, which I think is more akin to where um, a lot of you guys are. And it's such a, a beautiful description of the story of the three sisters. So it's kind of uh, bringing us into this space of uh, this audio space of the plants. So I'll begin. The three sisters. It should be them who tell this story. Corn leaves rustle with a signature sound, a papery conversation with each other and the breeze. On a hot day in July, when the corn can grow six inches in a single day, there is a squeak of internodes expanding, stretching the stem towards the light. Leaves escape their sheaths with a drawn out creak. And sometimes when all is still, you can hear the sudden pop of ruptured pith when water filled cells become too large and turgid for the confines of the stem. These are the sounds of being, but they are not the voice. The beans must make a caressing sound, a tiny hiss as a soft haired leader twines around the sebaceous stem of the corn. Surfaces vibrate delicately against one another. Tendrils pulse as they cinch around the stem something only a nearby flea beetle could hear. But this is not the song of the beans. I've lain among ripening pumpkins and heard creaking as the, per the, the parasol leaves rock back and forth, tethered by their tendrils, wind lifting their edges and easing them down again. A microphone in the hollow of a swelling pumpkin would reveal the pop 
of seeds expanding and the rush of water filling succulent orange flesh. These are sounds, but not the story. Plants tell their stories not by what they say, but what they do. What if you were a teacher but had no voice to speak your knowledge? What if you had no language at all and yet there was something you needed to say? Wouldn't you dance it? Wouldn't you act it out? Wouldn't your every movement tell the story? In time, you would become so eloqu eloquent that just to gaze upon you would reveal it all. And so it is with these silent green lives. A sculpture is just a piece of rock with topography hammered out and chiseled in. But that piece of rock can open your heart in a way that makes you feel different for having seen it. It brings its message without a single word. Not everyone will get it though. The language of stone is difficult. Rock mumbles, but plants speak in a tongue that every breathing thing can understand. Plants teach in a universal language, food. <laughs> so yeah, just bringing this idea of this, you know, contemplative listening and that, that energy that is all around us and how attuned we can be to our own spaces and our own surroundings. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to, um, thanks, Jaina. I'm just going to speak a little bit, um, just to continue the sort of the narrative from our first session um, and develop it a little bit um, to give some direction, a little bit of direction to, um, to sort of where I guess the, the, the area we're going with this and uh, the inspiration, I guess, and the importance for us anyway. Um, so we, uh, I, I read something I had written called, last time called Sonic Ecology. And so that is a very uh, open, very uh, imaginative, uh, phrase for me. And so it, it's gotten me thinking about uh, myself as an artist, as a musician, as a human, just so much differently when you think about how sound can can animate the whole becoming of, of any place, any time. Um, and actually, I, I uh, after I had heard that section, um, I had just discovered this, um, this field recording well, one of uh, the really great masters of field recording bernie cross and uh i there was a podcast on him that a friend sent who was at the last session and um he he was uh was here in california in the 60s he played uh a, i think bass in some actually quite quite well-known rock bands here and he was uh he was leading that life here as a as a you know, as a free and a, a musical hippie in, in San Francisco. And his life completely uh, changed when he went up to Mere Woods, which is a, an old redwood forest where she and I have been. Um, and he uh, took recording equipment and recorded uh, the sound there. And it, it can completely changed his life. And it's quite actually moving to hear him speak about that uh, in this podcast. I can share the link. Um, it's not too long. And it's, it's very interesting because his whole life after that went from from being a musician to recording nature, but listening to nature as basically musical, you know, and one of the important um, aspects of his work, which I wanted to bring up um, to consider um, is that every organism has a sonic place. And there's a there's a you could say an ecological bandwidth, which is always going to Know, have some some room for uh, for something to express itself, and that's how when you listen to soundscapes of forests or oceans or anywhere, you can find band like areas where the, the organisms have evolved to fill that space, and that is actually if we can think about the 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 sonic print that nature is is sort of is is creating is that everything has a place and a, and a, a harmonic resonance with each other or a non-harmonic. If something starts to take over and dominate, then that's when the species get, you know. And so the big, the big thing that he found is that, that the Anthropocene, the, the human footprint on this planet is actually sonically changing these, these ecologies and therefore um, species are actually becoming extinct. And uh, he's, he's gone back uh, to places that he recorded in the 60s and the 70s 
Um, and there's, there are actually no more. Um, even if the, the forest, let's say, or the, the grassland or whatever the environment was, he, uh, he recorded, sometimes it's just not there. Um, but sometimes it's still there, but the, the surrounding city area or the surrounding human um, uh, encroachment. Yeah, has actually um, just, just sort of destroyed the, the whole plethora of the, of the ecology. And it's very much sonic. And so, you know, I think it's absolutely in this day and age really important. And that's sort of one of the questions that gets, that got me thinking outside of just, you know, sound as music or art, but really sound as, as an ecology in which we need to create sustainability, you know? So with that, um, just a little bit more um, about um, this contemplative listening. And I think that we're, uh, you know, we're allowing it to unfold as it does. And we want, you know, all of your uh, participation and your, your input into how this can be productive and, uh, you know, um, a, a great experience in all ways. Um, and I was inspired by a, a class I took at my university, California Institute of Integral Studies, and it was on contemplative uh, uh, studies. And uh, it's, a, it's a fairly new academic field. Um, and they've, they've had for a long time religious studies. There's a lot of different um, types of academic discourses that are going to be very similar or overlapping. But this one was, was created to help, first of all, like a cross-cultural um, dialogue between different type of, types of contemplative practices. Um, so obviously, contemplation um, is embedded in, in religion. And so there's a nice overlap there where contemplative studies and religion, religion studies are actually quite, quite uh, in harmony. But in terms of uh, what is contemplation, it's a, it's a, that's an extremely big and very open idea. And so this author of the first sort of the textbook who's trying to create the container of this, which I guess I just wanted to bring up just to help contextualize a little bit, what does, what sort of, where are we sort of with this? And everybody has their own idea of what that means to them and their own form of, you know, when they're really uh, able to identify with a contemplative mode or modality or consciousness. Um, he defines it as there's three things. Um, one being there's a, a critical subjectivity. So the idea is that we are, um, where there is an inward turn to an awareness about our subjectivity, our, our, our conscious experience in a sense. And so the idea is that we will engage with, with um, a subject matter or a doing of something or a, um, a reflecting on something. But we will, we will observe ourselves and we will have the ability to go through the, the process, the contemplation, but also have the ability to look at it from different perspectives. And, and which is very important to come up with ideas about this, sort of like walking around the circle, uh, for the point of the circle from many places. Um, the next thing is a, a commitment to regular practice. So, you know, that's going to make a lot of sense in, let's say, a more of a uh, religious context um, where you can, you know, you can see that the mon monastic life is based on uh, building a container that is very, very much built on that, uh, like a daily practice of of whatever, however they're um, structuring their, their, their religion and how contemplative studies would, or contemplation would fit into that. Um, but I think that out, outside of that, in all of our, our individual lives, you know, we can, we can all relate to each other um, in the sense that there are things that we do on a, on a daily basis. We cultivate certain things, um, you know, let's say music in, you know, some of our, some of our uh, examples here, but um, the idea of a regular practice is important because then you can, you can reflect on it and, and grow through it, you know. Um, and then the last thing that, that this um, scholar believes is important in this field is the idea of, of some kind of a self-transformation through the process. Um, and that would have to be, be based on kind of goals of becoming. So like we you would, there's a certain goal and then you would contemplate or you would go into a practice, a contemplative practice that will help you like realize that goal. And so there's a, there, there is the idea of this, this, the subject or the subjectivity of the practice is going to 
have some kind of a, a trajectory and then we we you move through that and and grow and so it's a, again very open it's it's secular non secular um it's it can be um sitting in in silent meditation it can be going and protesting you know so it's like many many uh, different ways of thinking about contemplation and so with that kind of container uh, i think that it's it's really beautiful to have a group and a collective practice based on on some of these ideas and um i think that for me uh, and andrew and shana it just we we felt we started craving this idea that let's to start developing a community and uh, a space which can enter into um trying to really listen and engage with music in a contemplative way and that means doing the thing um and you know positioning ourselves in a way that we can listen to sound um you know different different perspectives sound is sound sound is culture sound is self sound is other um sound as story or narrative sound as time time experience um and sound is energy like you can keep on you know make it personalize this and uh those are some of the thoughts that i had and so i think that that's that's where some of the questions will arise from um and so let's just uh that's that's all i sort of wanted to share and say and just uh um let's let's get into that space where where these questions can arise uh, from all different perspectives about what we listen to about the process about the um you know the inspiration behind the music about the 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 traditions involved in it um and uh we have an interest in cross-cultural or transcultural music, music that goes beyond sort of certain kind of traditional frameworks. And so there are a lot of good questions or, or you know, uh, interesting questions um, that, that, that can come up. So let's just sit with that and see what com comes up and I'll, I'll pass it over to, to uh, my brother to uh, get the ball rolling and introduce our very special guest. Thanks, John. Uh... So uh, just before I introduce uh, Andrew, I wanted to just quickly uh, speak to the sense that Jonathan kind of left off on, which is um, the idea of community and how we kind of just kind of came up that we were inspired to create this, um, these sessions. Uh, it came from us feeling this kind of the desire or urge to reconnect with our community. Um, and in doing so, by, by doing our relaunch, we were able to, uh, you know, to, to, reconnect with a, a lot of a lot of you and uh, a lot of other people that that was really um, I think inspiring and so when we think about what we want to do uh, with this uh, with these events and with this kind of uh, contemplating listening sessions what came to mind was just this idea of community and how do we uh, you know what are the benefits of the of community in general and how do we cultivate that um, and so you know the, the things that came up for me were, were this sense of um, being connected. So, I mean, right now, I think we're all feeling a little uh, disconnected from, from this COVID and isolation. So the idea that we can still um, connect with each other uh, through Zoom, which I'm sure everyone's been doing in different ways, um, and just kind of relearning how that can actually be meaningful or not, you know, and, and, and trying to engage in it in a, in a way. So how can we create a community online, virtual, but also in the real world that we feel connected? Um, to each other in whatever way that might be. It's all individualized and personalized with each other. Um, <clears throat> the idea with that comes with like belonging. So belonging to something, maybe it's something that just has meaning for you and, and for us. Uh, and so that's, that's also something that comes up. The idea too that community um, has to do with um, like the challenges that uh, arise from different perspectives, right? We're encouraging, we need different perspectives, but there's also challenges that come along with that. Maybe uh, someone's perspective might, might, might push you or um, be contrary to your perspective. And that's, that's, that's a good thing because it pushes us into those areas where we can grow. Um, and so that's, that's an important aspect of community. But what comes with that is also a sense of like trust um, with, uh, within the circle, within the community, that that's, that's gonna be something that we can um, safely do. So that if, if there are contrary views or anything that comes up that could be, um, you know, uh, it could potentially be divisive in that way that no, this is a safe space so that we, that we don't, uh, um, we do, we, we're looking for, to make sure that, that's, uh, that there's trust involved in that. Um, and I guess the last thing that I felt like came up with that was that with that comes this idea that we can use this practice 
as, as like a healing practice. It's not only something to inspire each other and ourselves, but also to heal. So when we're listening, we can use the, the sounds, the sonic um, things that will be shared and, and contemplated. And, uh, and that's going to allow us to individually heal in whatever way we need. And in a sense, collectively heal, right. To be able to, to kind of move forward. So I just wanted to share that because that was something that came up with uh, when we were speaking about a few things we wanted to talk to. Um, and now I'd like to introduce um, the, uh, uh, our special guest presenter today. So one of the things that we discussed that we wanted to do was each time we meet, we wanted to um, ask somebody to, to present their music, whatever they feel like they want to present to the community. And uh, someone that came up who was in our relaunch event was uh, Andrew Tumar. And I actually uh, met Andrew very briefly, just once more than a decade ago while I was at Humber College, I went and, uh, and joined an open rehearsal of the uh, Gamelon at the Indonesian consulate. And uh, Andrew was there, he was leading it and running it. And, and I remember it just being kind of, you know, taken on this journey into this other world of, of this, this beautiful uh, uh, music and these instruments. And, uh, and I didn't have much more of an interaction with Andrew at that point, but something definitely uh, settled in me because I always kept an interest in that. But uh, obviously I kind of went to India in, in a different direction, but still, uh, so it was really nice to see that reconnection as being back here in Toronto. Um, and so Jonathan and Jen and I had a nice discussion with Andrew. And, uh, and so maybe what I can do is I can just quickly introduce um, Andrew through what in case you're not sure of uh, you know what he uh, has what his career and what who he is so during Andrew's long career he has explored studied played taught and curated music from various regions of the world today he is perhaps best known as the Canadian activist pioneer on the international gamelan music scene for nearly four decades Andrew has led an active career as a soloist on the Sudanese suling and which is the West Javanese bamboo ring flute uh, as well as serving as a co-founder and former artistic director of Toronto's Evergreen Club Contemporary Gamelon, Canada's first gamelon group, um, uh, Evergreen uh, Club Contemporary Gamelon. Uh, eight professional musicians can be heard on uh, 25 albums on TV uh, and, ho and many Hollywood feature films. So, uh, you know, we're not, to today we're, we're also trying to, uh, you know, to, to present uh, music that is, uh, that we can all, listen to and contemplate together, but for sure we also hope this inspires that sense of, uh, of going deeper into the music that, that is being shared in Andrew's uh, vast uh, career. There's a, there's a lot to be checked out, so we look forward to that too. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Andrew, uh, and I hope we can all enjoy. Thank you, Andrew. Too many Andrews. There can never be too many Andrews. My father was Andrew. My son is named Andrew, so <laughs> too many Andrews. Is everybody muted? I guess so. Okay, everybody's gonna be muted. All right, thanks for the intro and thanks for the, the wonderful meditation, Shana. Uh, so I was also inspired, I was gonna do something else. Uh, Andrew and I were all ready to, uh, to play a video of a, a piece of mine called Open Fifths, Open Hearts to, to uh, start our session today with the meditative mood. On the other hand, uh, Jonathan's uh, introduction and, and, and uh, uh, mentioning of field recordings uh, and the impact that they have uh, on some people um, uh, is inspired me to start with another, another piece. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it takes, it's actually a very good segue because um, maybe I should mention my approach to listening and to music and my career, my whole career. Um, because it, it's not only a, uh, a discipline for me, and, and of course, it's been my career, most of all of my adult life, really, but it's also my primary spiritual practice. Uh, so some of these things I'm, I'm mentioning uh, that I'll mention to you tie into all of those things, all of the above. Um, so I mentioned field recordings. It actually goes back to the 1970s. Yes, I'm that old. So uh, I, I was one of the, the generation that was interested in 
uh, synths. And, and of course, in the 70s, they were all analog. So part of uh, the discipline, uh, when I was working in the studios, and I worked at York University Studios, electronic studios for a number of years as an undergrad, um, back in the 70s, I went with some of the recording equipment, high-end recording equipment into the field and um, recorded sounds I heard around me. And that inspired me in a lot of ways. One of the projects that was generated was called Frog Bog, which was both field, a, a series of field recordings I did over a number of years in Southern Ontario uh, uh, places, sites, where frogs uh, did their thing, mostly chorus, chorus uh, calls uh, over the years. But uh, I was also um, inspired to do all kinds of other listenings at different times of the year because of course as you know frogs are most active in their mating um, activities in the spring early spring so that was in the 70s and a friend of mine and this this ties very nicely into what andrew was mentioning in my career in in gamelan gamelan is a kind of gong chime orchestra from uh, that originated in indonesia can i get a Show of hands. How many of you heard, actually heard Gamelan live? Show of hands. Live. Okay, so a few people. Uh, and some of you have heard of Gamelan. I, so that, that's, that's, I always like to know what people are, you know, who I'm, who I'm speaking to. Because, you know, I can't see the, uh, the forest for the trees. It's part of my life. It's been an integral part of my life. And, and before that, so I, uh, I was invited by my friend John Siddall to uh, join the first gamelan group in Canada. That was the Evergreen Club of Toronto, 1983. The instruments arrived at Pearson on February the 14th, so Valentine's Day. Uh, and then the rest is history. I've been involved with the group ever since. Uh, and you can do the math how many years, so it's, it's been uh, most, of my, most of my career. Um, so when John, that's John Siddall, asked me to uh, compose some pieces for the first concert, which was at Hart House in uh, 19, in the fall of 83, I thought of combining some of those field recordings I did in the 70s with some um, other field recordings. Actually, uh, some, uh, I had an LP of, uh, some music made by uh, minorities in the uh, highlands of Vietnam. These, these were recordings made back in the, in the 50s. And uh, so I was inspired by those to create a kind of a minimalist piece of, in three movements um, that uh, uh, included some of my interests in minimalism and some of my listening to this uh, music from this culture that I had previously not known. It's a gong culture. In other words, they have gongs. So there was a kind of a, a sonic connection to the, to the world of uh, gamelan, which of course uh, also has gongs. And uh, as well as Field recordings. Now, these field recordings that you'll hear, and I won't play you the whole thing, but uh, maybe part of the first movement, um, the field recordings were all in southern Ontario. They start off with a, a stream, a very small a brook, really, in near Norville, which is near uh, Georgetown. And that stream find its way through to the Credit River eventually somehow and then then to Lake Ontario. So the, the piece really in, uh, encompasses that whole sonic and, and geographic uh, region between, uh, you know, uh, uh, Georgetown or Caledon and, uh, and the lake. And so I introduced all of the sounds of nature in that area. So uh, I think I should uh, segue, cue up, 
a piece called North of Java. And I called it North of Java because the uh, when I looked at the globe, I'm very fond of geography. When I look at the globe and I traced Java, which is where the instruments that you're that we're playing are from, uh, you know, up above the uh, the, uh, the, the the Arctic Circle here and then down, it, it landed somewhere near Ontario. So I thought it would be a, a fun title, and in fact, that became the uh, the title of the album, which I I showed you this this piece here. It's an LP, still shrink wrapped. Apparently, it's worth a lot of money now. And this is the uh, this is the group then. Um, and you can see, I'm the suling player over there. That's the the guy was. I might have. Yeah, I've got a little beard and and stuff. Uh, so I'm playing the the suling, which is the instrument that I showed you earlier on. Uh, so I'll play a little bit of that now. First movement of North of Java. We'll see if I can find uh, where that is on the uh, internal player.
And we're back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, great. So we actually, we went well into the second movement there. Uh, and um, uh, I guess part of this exercise was to um, was to focus in on certain aspects of the music. Um, one of the one of the things I wanted to mention was uh, I mentioned already the field recordings. My idea was that the uh, recordings that the the the, the uh, field recordings and the live music music making would form two texts that would inform each other. So while we're playing, we're listening to the the recordings and interacting with them in in various ways. So uh, any questions? Now might be a good time for people to give some feedback. I guess you can just uh, just uh, unmute yourself and yeah, yeah any questions? I've and just made it so want... anyone can unmute themselves. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Aiden and Taya. Did you want to say something? Oh, I I was just saying that the it started sounding really cheeky. <laughs> like it sounded really um, I don't know, made me think of like four thirty in the morning right now when like the birds are chirping outside, <laughs> and then as it kept going, it started sounding I don't know like later in the day. <laughs> I liked it a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's the, we, we got into the second movement, the, the fourth movement. Actually, very uh, interesting, very astute observation, because actually part of the score imagines that we're going through the day. <laughs> uh, part of, uh, so it starts early in the morning and you hear those chirping sounds. Actually, we start with water, the water I mentioned the, of the brook. And then, and then we hear the water of some carp in Lake Ontario. And then I'm also playing a water drum at the beginning. Oh, I have to apologize. Uh, we, I had some technical difficulties and um, right at the beginning, instead of a beautiful fade in and the, and the delicate sounds of the overtone flute, uh, there was some um, other sounds that came in. So, you know, I was trying to text Andrew K and uh, apparently that, that triggered the uh, our our inboard player here to uh, to go on to the next tune, but anyway, so the piece does go through the different parts of the day and also the different parts of the year because uh, it goes on from um, uh, fish to amphibians to bird. Of course, birds are always there, but then on to crickets and grasshoppers, which are more common in the uh, late summer and early fall. So that was part of the concept. So very nice uh, observation. Thanks for saying that. Any, uh, anything else? Before moving on? Yeah, my, I felt like uh, we were moving from a more um, like peaceful uh, kind of pre-colonization kind of feeling into a more, you know, industrialized um, energy. And, you know, like, cause it didn't feel very, very natural and very slow. And the way that the music was interacting with the environment was, it seemed more homogenous. Like it was, it worked with that um, kind of um, like, uh, environment environmental kind of sound and then it got more uh, like very specifically like industrialist rhythmic kind of feel to me and I felt like it was being more like overpowered and put into a space you know and being like formed and you know uh, formulated into something else anyways it's interesting, uh, Shana, you, you mentioned that uh, 
Jonathan mentioned earlier, the, uh, uh, I forget the, the artist that you mentioned. Can you give me his name again? The, the field recorder? Yeah. yeah. Bernie Cross. Bernie, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you mentioned that he went back some decades later and that in sonic environment was no longer there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, those recordings that I made were back in the 70s and uh, things did evolve, especially with acid rain. It affected especially the amphibians a lot. And uh, certainly the soundscape that was there in the 70s it changed uh, uh, significantly in the 80s and the 90s. That's, from, from what I understand, it's starting to recover a little bit. It has recovered, so which is great. But it, it definitely, um, another aspect of that work, I was really engaged with this work, uh, this frog bog idea. I, I took actually musicians out there in, into the woods and we performed with choruses, with frog and tree frog choruses and toads. And I also took recordings, high-end recordings into not just the studio, but uh, into, um, into performances. I performed with these field recordings with dancers, choreographers, um, uh, Marie Chouinard, for instance, and also uh, some of you uh, might have heard of uh, uh, John Hassel, the trumpet player. He, his second album he did with, uh, with Eno, Brian Eno, and he used uh, um, one of these frog bog recordings of mine in, on one of the tracks. So it, it, it was kind of, uh, a big part of my, it, it was a substantial part of my work. But getting back to Shana's point, uh, I came to a kind of impasse with it because I felt that my presence, especially when, you know, the acid rain situation, you, you, some of you are too young maybe to remember that, but when it became really an issue and really evident, uh, the impact it's doing to our environment, um, I became very concerned that my, um, imposition of my own, uh, you know, will and, you know, human uh, culture is, uh, is something that um, I had difficulty with, uh, you know, yeah. taking it out, like imposing that, that, that idea, of my will to this thing. And then uh, in a sense, it's, it's kind of like cultural appropriation. I, I started to feel that. And so I stopped doing that for, for decades. But this example is, um, uh, and I, I've gone back to it more recently. I, I don't think we have time to play that, but in some of my solo suling pieces, I sometimes use some of these old field recordings and uh, kind of connect with the space that I grew up in, that I live in, uh, and, um, and, and also in, in a sense, not just the geography of it, but in a sense, the timeline of it, because these recordings capture a time uh, that is, is is gone, you know, 40 years ago. By the way, that recording was recorded in a studio in 1986 in uh, Scarborough. <laughs> it's a long time ago itself. Okay, uh, if there are no more, if there are, are there any more questions? I mean, I could talk obviously a long time about this, but and about the structure. Uh, for the musicians out there, I, I see a few. Um, there are three movements. We heard uh, the first interrupted at the beginning, and then we heard a bit of the second. Uh, the, the, the form of the piece is additive and then subtractive. And in, in the middle of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of each section, each movement, uh, there's a free section where uh, we use a concept uh, that's sometimes known as um, subtractive improvisation. And that's where we we're not only listen to ourselves, but we also listen to uh, the, the recording and, and the sounds that, that, that are on the field recordings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Yeah, okay. well, let's listen to something else. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, I sent a bunch of, a number of, um, options. I think you, you have all of those uh, uh, available, right? The YouTube options. Yeah. Set yep. to Monsoon. I think maybe um, 
maybe the next piece would be Ibu Trish. Do you see that? Can you share that with our guests, with listeners? Uh, yeah. So well, while the first selection was from 19, uh, actually the recording was from 1986, so a little bit before YouTube, this next one is definitely uh, on YouTube. Uh, should I, uh, Andrew, should I uh, give, give a, um, a, a little bit of a, a background now or should I give the story after the re listening session? Uh, I think as you wish. I mean, you know, if you feel like uh, giving a context will be helpful, then please do. Right. If you'd rather it be a mystery, then that's okay too. Um, I like my mysteries, uh, but I think now you're facing, now you're going to see the instruments uh, that Evergreen Club plays, a group that I've been involved in all these years. Um, this this uh, recording was made in the Bavarian State stu Recording Studio at a concert two years ago. It was an international gamelan con con uh, conference and we were representing Canada. Um, so in this piece, this was written by Lou Harrison, who was an American composer, lived in the second, he was active in the, mostly in the second part of the last century. And uh, uh, I know him pretty well. Um, he died about 15 years ago. And he wrote this piece for us. This was written in 1987, 88, 89, between those years. Very a kind of simple score, uh, but there is no score for the suling, which is the instrument you'll see me playing. So I think what would be interesting for listeners, and I'm assuming all, almost all of you are going to be new to this piece and new to this uh, way of making music with these instruments, um, what would be interesting it would be to listen to my playing how I change from instrument to instrument and to compare the melodies that I'm making up because there is no part for me. I, I'm improvising here, but obviously I'm playing with the, the melody that is uh, in the score, uh, playing with, against, anticipating, echoing, uh, and I'm consciously um, so at points using notes not in the scale of the other instruments for effect. And I'm also using timing for effect. So I'll, I'll come in, you know, like, like most, I guess, improvisers and jazz players, which I'm not, I want to say, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of anticipating the downbeat and, or, you know, back playing way back in the phrase. So I think that's enough. So, uh, enjoy Evil Trish.
<laughs> Beautiful. I tried to unmute everyone so you could hear that applause, but everyone's <laughs> muted. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, it seems like Andrew's just getting his uh, audio or video back. Can you can you hear um, can you hear us, Andrew? There you go. I think you're unmuted now. Yeah, Andrew. Can you, yes. Can you hear me? Well, we're just waiting for uh, Andrew to get back with us here. There you go. Yeah, you're unmuted now, Andrew. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Hello there. Maybe I'll have to rejoin. Yes, we can hear you, can Andrew. You hear can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Andrew? Can you hear? I'm not sure. Maybe the audio from our side is not uh, coming through to you, but we can definitely hear you. Yeah. Sometimes you do have to rejoin. I don't know why, but. Maybe in the meantime, while Andrew figures that out, does anyone want to? Uh, to share. I have a question specifically for Andrew, but if you can't hear me, then. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I guess you can hear me, but I can't hear you, so I have no clue what's going on. I'll have to uh, maybe rejoin the session. Yeah. Message. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll let Andrew do that. Um, I will save my question until we have him back. Does anyone want to share any of their, uh, what came up for them or what? Uh... I have a question. You have to unmute. All right, I'm oh, okay. <laughs> can you hear? Can you hear us? <laughs> hear you. Um, I I'm wondering what the instrument was in the very front. It looked a lot like pots or something, but it was very cool. And I was, I was wondering what it was called. I've never seen it before. Yeah. yeah. Don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, all of, I, as far as I know, all of the instruments there are traditional instruments. Um, and so it's a part of the gamelan uh, orchestra. All of the different, the gamelan is about, you know, it could be in, uh, different numbers of instruments. I'm not sure if it's always fixed or if it changes, but I've seen different scenarios. And, and those ones are like, they're basically vertical gongs. So the same as the big ones in the back that were played that were hanging, it's the same thing, but vertical and they're set around. Do you want to share, Sean? I think they're called uh, Bonang, B-O-N-A-N-G, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. I had to memorize it for a test a few months yeah, ago, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put my money on you. Let's ask the expert when he comes back. <laughs> oh, it looks like he's back. Yeah. I'm back. There we go. Can you hear us? No, I had to, uh, I had to rejoin because my connection went kablooey. Okay. So what what did did you did you all were you able to hear the uh, or see the uh, video? Yeah. 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 I think it must have just dropped out for you, but I think we all uh, we all had it yeah. to the end. Excellent. Um, okay. So I'm sorry for the hassle, but yeah, my computer is completely shut down, so I had to rejoin. Okay. One one question that came up uh, for for me, but also the the tag on to what Ty had asked um, was just. And uh, for people who are not so familiar, uh, and I, I don't, I'm not so familiar, <laughs> but is the, all the instruments that are on stage, they're all traditional instruments um, of gamelan specifically or different types of gamelan. Like how much is traditional versus contemporary? In a, you know, and so from someone who's listening from outside and looking at that, I could easily say, well, I would just assume that might be a traditional piece, but what, what could make that um, contemporary? or other yeah, aspects of any kind of transculturalism in that specifically. And like the one instrument I noticed was in the middle beside you using mallets, but it looked more like an orf or like a, um, 
uh, xylophone rather than the other, but I don't know. So I was wanted to ask if you could maybe share what the makeup was, not only of the instruments, but also the traditions that people were playing or drawing from and the right. composition, just to give an and, idea. And also to, to restate Taya's question. Do you want to ask Taya? Right. Sure. I was wondering oh. what the instrument was at the front it looked like pots or something to me. yeah listen uh, i mean to answer to answer all of those questions we need a couple of more sessions guys i don't know if you're up for it <laughs> but i'm um, i'm always up for it uh literally we'll need a couple of sessions i mean i've got a uh, I, I i i'm assuming our time is up but i've got a powerpoint presentation with all that stuff I can give you the names, the ranges, the and all of the, the details of that. Be happy to do that. Spent uh, you know a long time learning about these things and teaching it, so that's my passion. But to, to the simple answer to Andrew's questions is yes. <laughs> <laughs> these are all from Indonesia. They're all from a specific part of Indonesia. Like all gamelan music is regional. You know, as, as in jazz, I mean, jazz is kind of international. So you can play jazz anywhere in the world and it's more or less jazz. But, um, you know, this kind of, the, the, these sets of instruments are very specific to Western part of Java in Indonesia. So they're from a very specific place. Like like I mentioned, you know, the recordings uh, in North Africa, recordings from a very specific place. I mean, the, the brook, uh, at the be the sound of the stream at the beginning of my piece is from the back of my father's property in Norval, Ontario, where I went and I discovered this little brook running there. And so, and at the end of the piece, which we didn't hear, we hear the waves on the southern shore of uh, of Central uh, Center Island in, in in Toronto Harbor. So, these are very specific things, sounds bring us to place and time that's kind of what i was getting at for my first piece and it, and and in this last piece i know you it's a lot to take in but maybe maybe what you can take in is the spirit of play and what i'm doing with the suling is kind of playing off all the other instruments uh, and i think to get spe into specifics uh i'd be happy to do another couple of sessions for you guys <laughs> So what was your question, Taya? I was just wondering what the instrument in the front was. Oh, uh, Bonang. Bonang. <laughs> Got that right. Bonang. Bonang, you passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who, who said that? Who said um, that? I, I, Sean? I, when you were trying to rejoin, I had to memorize uh, the names of the instruments in the Gamelan Ensemble for a class last semester. And that's one of the only ones Which I remember. Which class? Um, Which class? That was uh, Music in the Modern Era with uh, Irene Markoff at York University. Yeah, Irene. I, I've given some lectures in her classes in the past. Yeah. I know Irene. Yeah, um, yeah so uh, yeah, I've actually, some years ago, when Evergreen was on tour, we met a friend of one of the band members. I'm not sure what it was, but his name was, his last name was Bonang. And he, he said it's a Scottish name, so I don't know, man. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a, in ethnomusicology, it's called a gong chime because it's a series of gongs that, that you can play melodies on. And the person playing it is Mark Duggan, who is a, a very well-known percussionist. I don't know how many of you guys have worked with Mark. He's, he's, a, he's, he's been on the scene in Toronto for the last 40 years. He's uh, teaching at, uh, sometimes he teaches at, he used to teach at Hamburg, he used to teach at U of T. He did his uh, DMA at U of T. And uh, anyway, the point is, uh, he's, he was playing very beautifully, very idiomatically on the Bonang. Uh, you probably noticed his uh, very sensitive uh, uh, flaming technique, and he's doing all kinds of very uh, uh, complicated phrasing, even though the piece is in. Well, the piece is very interesting. It's uh, it's not in any meter except that tag in the middle, which is in five. So, uh, and I'm, I'm blowing on top of all that stuff. Any other questions?
Did you have another question, uh, Andrew? Uh, I think you had about five questions in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I'll go over to uh, Dave K. Who's that? I'm right here. I think I think that music was an excellent choice for Shana's birthday. Oh, really? <laughs> Why is that? Because it's her birthday today. Oh no! I, okay, happy birthday, Shana. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad it sounds festive. <laughs> to me, it's contemplative. It, it well, makes thank you think you. about different things. Yeah, I mean, to, for me personally, it takes me on a journey. It's uh, the beginning and the end. It's always very uh, moody for me. I always kind of dig deep and allow myself to get very. Uh, I'm not sure where it. it it, and it difference, it, it's different every time, you know, because you know, the beautiful thing about improvisation is that you can, you can feel, you're not constrained by the, uh, the sheet of music in front of you, you know, you can dig deep uh, inside, uh, wherever you are. And I was physically in the Bayerische Radiofunk, you know, it, in the heart of Bavaria there in Munich. Uh, but, you know, I guess my, my soul, my, my emotions were somewhere else. So that, that's kind of the, uh, I have a, a very um, um, wonderful seat in that group in, in a piece like that, where I get a chance to indulge in my, my personal uh, feelings and, uh, and, and maybe a little bit of virtuosity there too. I'm able to just go crazy, whatever I feel like doing. And the beauty of these uh, guys, and most of them are percussionists, some of the top in, in town. Um, I don't know how many of you worked with Blair Mackay. He's a drummer. He's, he, he was playing drummer. Hey, Ted. <laughs> Blair was playing kandang. He had a little solo in the middle section there. Yeah, yeah. And I, we always tell him to go crazy. That's when I switched to the, uh, to the uh, cheng cheng, which are kind of uh, uh, symbols. Uh, just to kind of amplify that that sound. So the, the the idea, the mental image in the center section is that it, it's it's Blair's solo. He's doing a blum so, drum solo, and you probably notice he's doing do 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 <laughs> like a drummer might do, like a trap, because he's you know he's been doing that ever since he was a kid. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, so the idea in the center section is like it's a battle scene in a in a wayang. Wang is is uh, Indonesian uh, puppetry, puppet theater. So he's like accompanying. We're imagining a battle scene in five. You know, so <laughs> that's the deal. There, it's kind of aggressive, and he gets a chance to to do a little blowing. Um, not quite the black page, but he, he he can nail the black page too. You know, Ted. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's for, that's for an extra sing session, the black page solos. <laughs> What, what, what was that, Andrew? I said for our next listening session, we'll go through the, the Zappa Black Page for sure. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have a drummer do that for him. Any other questions about this thing that we just listened to? Um, yeah, I wanted yeah. to. Oh, Vio. You go ahead. It's okay. No, no, please, please. I hand you. Uh, Thanks a lot, it was beautiful. And um, I wonder if you can tell something about like if the spirituality behind this. And I mean, I don't know if there is or not. You're, I I'm sorry. I don't know anything about this kind of music, but uh, listening to this uh, last piece, it was very, I don't know if, I felt very connected, not only with, with myself, but uh, I know I had lots of images of different things and also the place there. I mean, obviously all in my imagination, but uh, it felt very deep. So I like, I like to know if, uh, for you personally, what does music represent in your journey as a musician but also as a human being and and what what is the scope of this music if there is thank you yes, Yolante, very deep questions <laughs> okay um 
I don't know where to start in terms of spirituality journey. You know, we're hearing one piece. It was a, it was part of a, we were playing at Evergreen Club, Contemporary Gamelan was playing a festival. This is one concert in one piece in one concert. We play six. Um, and we are there, as I said, representing Canada. So this piece was interesting. I mean, we're, we're a Canadian group. We're all Canadians in the group. We're all from Toronto. Um, originally, actually, I am not, I wasn't born in Toronto, kind of an outlier in the group. I was born in, uh, I, I'm assuming the accent, your beautiful accent is somewhere near Italia from Italy. I was born a little bit north of there, <laughs> actually a little bit north of Munich in Hungary. So that's where I was born. Uh, so my journey, you asked about my oh, journey. Oh, nice. Yeah, we're very close. Yes, I was born in Sumbatai, which yeah, is actually the... Actually, my name, it comes from Hungary. Pinazzi, sounds very Italian. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, well, okay, you will, you'll have to tell me some other time. But uh, so my journey took me, uh, we were, um, my family, my, my father specifically, was part of a revolution in 1946. <laughs> he was part of the uh, cohort of people who were... Uh, many thousands who resisted the Soviet occupation and uh, we, our family had to leave. So we were refugees in, in Austria. And then uh, we were able to, the whole family was able to emigrate to Canada, which took in uh, over 50,000 Hungarians at that time. Uh, so I found myself, we found ourselves in Toronto in 1957. So I'm really Canadian uh, in that way that so many, so many of my friends are. Um, but what's interesting, and I spent a whole career here, and I'm still here, right here on uh, Davisville. I live on Davisville, Mount Pleasant. Um, but my imagination and my career, let's just say my career, has taken off to Southeast Asia, specifically uh, the island of Java, Indonesia, Java, and more specifically West Java, because on the one island, there's over 130 million people living, and it's divided up into a number of different cultural groups and with, with great history, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the instruments that you saw are called dugung. And dugung is a very um, specifically uh, found and performed in, in West Java by the Sundanese people. So West Java is the home of this uh, ensemble. The piece you heard was written by uh, Lou Harrison, as I mentioned, the American composer who died about 15 years ago. And uh, uh, someone mentioned the um, the bonang, the instrument at the at the front. The way th and there's no bonang part in this piece, so it was it was devised. It was created by Mark, the player, who who kind of uh, brought to the part uh, some South Central, Central Javanese idioms to his Bonang play. And also, I think, um, since he sometimes plays jazz, maybe a jazz feel as well. And in my playing, I bring a lot of different influences. Um, my first, uh, I didn't uh, mention this, but uh, in 1970, 71, I started studying Carnatic vocal music at York University with my guru, um, John Higgins, who became my mentor he, a few years later. He encouraged me on my uh, journey, my, my experimentation, always encouraged me to push things, um, push the envelope. Um, he was a great teacher and a great, uh, um, a, a great mentor. Uh, he, he was a Yankee, but he was probably the first vocalist, certainly a Carnatic vocalist, to be considered, um, you know, on a professional level by South Indian um, musicians and um, uh, and fans of, of the music, of which there are many. So I had a model there, you know, as we keep hearing these days about we all need models, somebody who looks like us. Well, he kind of looked like me, um, a Yankee, 
white guy, but um, he found his home, his voice, literally his voice in South India in Carnatic music. And in a way, um, in, in a real way, I found my voice in uh, playing this instrument, the suling. So, and of course, I have many kinds. This is the small one. Of course, there are much larger ones. <laughs> um, so, in terms of spiritual practice, I'm not going to, I know our time is, I'm over time. As a musician, we have to be aware of time. Uh, I'm usually, well, I won't go on about that. Maybe, maybe my, my wife has, uh, would chime in on that, but uh, in terms of how bad I am. But uh, um, I think I mentioned early on that music for me is, is not just my profession, my avocation, but it's also my spiritual practice. And for me, it's, it's simple, but, but complicated because um, it, it, in order to kind of put it in one sentence, one thought, it connects me with the world outside myself. Whether it's the world of vibrations, we heard, you know, the sounds of carp in the water in the first piece, uh, bird song. Later on, there's owl and, 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 and you know, and, and amphibians, frogs, crickets, grasshoppers. So it connects me to the world outside myself. That's, that's what I've come to understand belief. So I don't know if that uh, answered your question, Violante, but that's what I got tonight. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Anything else? Hi. I think, yeah, I think you've summed up, you know, some things and left some nice tendrils out there for everybody to, to think about and wonder about and maybe, you know, troll through your, uh, your, your credit history and everything like that on, on the internet and find out more about you and maybe listen to, to more of your music and listen uh, to some of the YouTube videos. So thank you so much, Andrew, for being with us today. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us. Yeah. You know, you. really beautiful music. And I think that we can all connect, you know, through your music in that, in that way, of that, of that very organic um, and very um, cultural uh, feeling as well. So I think, uh, you know, you brought us together in this space so beautifully. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for inviting me, everyone, and thanks for joining us, uh, listeners and viewers. Uh, just one last word about the dugong, the instruments that you saw. That's only one of many types of gamelan, and the world, as you're getting a sense, perhaps, the world of gamelan is vast, and there's no way, even after you know, 37 years of doing it professionally, and also teaching it at uh, York University and at the conservatory and, and, and many other places. Uh, I'm just kind of, I feel I'm a, a total newbie with it. But I do know this genre fairly well. And uh, that, that is dugong. And it's, it's a um, set of instruments that uh, this group, Evergreen Club, has, uh, has developed a performance practice on. And also we've commissioned... Uh, we premiered more than 300 pieces. Uh, most of them are by um, Canadian, American, some, a few um, uh, European, but also Indonesian composers. So it's something that is, you know, it, as, I, as I said earlier, it's, for me, it's, it's the forest that I work, with, work in. It's hard for me to, to see the trees. But I'd be happy to... Uh, let Monsoon Music know soon as we can get out of this lockdown and, and uh, we know when our next performances are in Toronto. Because we, I'd, lo I'd love to invite you all so you can see it live and you can actually hear the instruments live and see us working on a number of pieces live. And also uh, I do a monthly meetup called Gamelon Meetup through the meetup. Um, and again, we're kind of I uh, had to cancel the last few months because of COVID, but I'm eager to get back. And that's a community jam. So I invite you all 
to sign up for Gamlan Meetup. And uh, then I'll let you know the next time that we have a jam. It's completely open, you know, all ages. Uh, you need to know, no, you, don't, you don't need to know the name of the, the Bona. We're okay, you're okay. I'll, we'll teach you everything. And in one session, you get to play with other people and make music on the same instruments that you heard. So I'm inviting you all. And uh, thanks again for uh, taking me into your living room. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks again. One last round of applause yeah. for Andrew, Andrew and your music. Thank you so much. Thanks, we'll all just uh, bring our energies into into this space together again, just in a quiet repo repose and reflection um, from the journey of where we've we've come through in all of this. So just finding yourself grounded feet firmly on the floor, sitting up tall, opening up the body, inhaling deeply, and exhale. Thank you everybody once again for being with us today. We'll be with you shortly via emails and any questions or comments that you want to send us at any time, please remember you are a part of this community. You're all welcome to contribute at any time. We value your input, your feedback, your suggestions, your comments. Uh, and just, you know, general, any kind of energy that you want to put our way, um, that would be absolutely amazing. So thank you once again for everybody who is with us in this space. You have blessed us. I feel amazing. Thank you.